Okay, so I would say welcome back everyone. So I see that um, some of you have already asked a few questions in the uh, in the chat. Um, so let me first um, address these. So there was one question that was asked already a, a little while ago um, uh, that I unfortunately didn't see before. So um, the first question was what property of this mechanically active structure allows us to map it's to a harmonic oscillator. So I think that was uh, referring to the question or the, the part all the way at the beginning. So I think, uh, let me uh, pull up that slide again. Uh, where is it? That's this one over here. Um, so in this case, uh, we have um, these, uh, these mechanical structures. They have sometimes very complicated eigen modes and we saw that we could map these onto these, uh, these things. So, um, uh, I can say that um, this is something that is not entirely trivial. So um, uh, for some easy cases, such as a beam or a string, uh, you can really write down the equation of motion that you have, uh, which is then a partial differential equation, both for the, um, uh, for the um, um, position dependence of the displacement, also for the time dependence. In that case, it's called the Euler-Bernoulli equation. Um, and you can rewrite that in terms of <clears throat> Uh, an operator acting on the uh, uh, on the displacement uh, containing fourth order derivatives and second order derivatives uh, of the displacement with respect to the position along the beam. Um, and then you can uh, prove that this is now a, um, a Mithian operator, that it has eigenfunctions that span the basis uh, of functions that uh, fulfill the uh, boundary conditions, and then in the end, you can expand all of your uh, functions uh, for the displacement in terms of these uh, these basis functions, and then you can really prove very nicely that you can map um, the uh, eigenmodes of mechanically active structures, in that case of the beam, onto a harmonic oscillator. So now, if you have uh, much more complex structures, such as the one that you uh, that you see over here, then it is not going to be uh, possible anymore to really prove that, but um, I can tell you that for all analytically solvable things, you can prove it. Uh, and therefore, we also believe that it's actually something that's kind of inherent to all the icon modes. But I think proving that is, uh, is more difficult. Okay, then another question that was asked. Um, in explaining the standard quantum limits, uh, we talked about the photon, uh, photon statistics. Uh, how does one obtain such a Poissonian distribution experimentally? So in this case, this was about the um, the slide um, where we talked about the Poissonian distribution and the Schott noise, that is uh, this thing over here. So indeed, uh, in this case, uh, this is now a um, measurement where you can see if you, um, if you are looking at your detector over here for one microsecond, how many uh, photons do you uh, get? And then of course, sometimes you don't get any photons. That is the probability P0 here or one or two or three or four or five. So this is something that you can really do in an experiment if you have a uh, single photon detector. In other words, then uh, when this detector is something that gives you a click when a photon falls onto this detector, and then you can simply count in one microsecond in this example, how many clicks your detector gave you. And then you say, oh, now it was four. And then uh, you repeat the experiment. And then you say, now it is three. And you repeat it, and now you find that it has 10, and so on. And that way, you can actually build these, uh, these histograms over here. So for that, uh, you would need to have uh, single photon detectors. Um, and uh, those are available. We use those in the lab uh, quite regularly. But uh, typically, what you use for the experiments in the way I describe them is actually to use a photo uh, detector that is not counting the photons individually, but actually uh, converts the incident light into a current. Uh, that is, every photon uh, creates electron and hole pairs. And these uh, electrons, for example, they flow through a wire. And this current is what you actually measure. Um, so in that sense, the measurement is a little bit more difficult. So in that sense, you can see measuring this current is actually counting electrons. And then you would get something very similar. But then, of course, you cannot really look at, uh, uh, at actually arrival of photons, but you would look at, say, average current and fluctuations in the current, and it would be something looks very similar, like over here. Um, 
Then um, the other question is about the standard quantum limit. Uh, and if it's a hard limit or that you can circumvent that, uh, is there a way to avoid the back action? Um, yeah, so again, uh, if we would have the entire course, we could dive a lot more into all these uh, interesting questions. Um, I can tell you that uh, all the way at the end, we're going to see that you can actually uh, circumvent the standard quantum limit. And that's also why it is called the standard quantum limit. It is not really the fundamental limit, but uh, by using very special uh, states, such as noon states um, or entangled states, you can actually go beyond this. But if you say um, I'm using relatively uh, regular states, um, that is, uh, for example, coherent states and so on, single photons, then uh, you arrive at the standard quantum limit. But indeed, there are ways to circumvent it. Um, and then another question is, uh, when we talked about the two spin one half particles, um, there were um, the two um, Z plus states initially, do we make any assumption on the physical system? Um, okay, so that was about um, a discussion we had on this slide over here. Um, no, so in this case, it is just an illustration of, uh, of how a measurement could actually look like. So in this case, uh, you probably have noticed we're now talking about spin one half particles, whereas in the rest of the uh, of the lecture, I am always focusing on um, on mechanical resonators, harmonic oscillators. So this is just an illustration, basically how this uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle works to kind of refresh our ideas uh, about the um, uh, quantum measurements. Okay, so those were the questions that I see here directly in the chat. Um, are there any other questions from the audience before we proceed? If so, please unmute yourself and you have the chance to ask your question. Okay, I don't hear any um, question then. Um, of course, we had a short lunch break. So let's revisit what we have just uh, learned before the break. So we talked about quantum limits on position detection and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is something that we're very familiar with from our quantum mechanics textbooks. And in this case, um, we see that uh, that was related to observables. In other words, to Hamithian operators and those Hamithian operators have eigenstates and also eigenvalues. And then when you do a strong measurement at one instance in time, then in this case, um, you will get one of those eigenvalues. And after that, your wave function or your quantum system is in that eigenstate corresponding to that eigenvalue. Um, and in this case, uh, when you have variables that do not commute, for example, the momentum and the displacement, then in this case, uh, that means that a little bit of time later, you will get more uncertainty in the position because we saw in the exercise that is uh, uncertainty in the momentum will grow as a function of time into a uncertainty in the position. So the thing that we learned is that also in this case, we talk about strong measurements at an instance in time. And that was not what we usually have in mind when we do optomechanics. So then we switched and saw uh, the house case derivation. That was a very general argument uh, based on the amplification of bosonic modes and commutators. Um, and in this case, um, we found that in the limit of high gain, we always have to add half a quantum of noise. But in this case, uh, although it is very general, it offered us very limited insight in what is actually going on. And uh, the picture that we have uh, was the one over here. Um, so then we turned our attention to something that uh, was making a bit more sense from a practical perspective. Namely, we uh, studied the standard quantum limit. And in this case, we did that by taking a specific detector, namely the fabric perot cavity with a movable end mirror in mind. In this case, we could see what happens if you now do a continuous but relatively weak measurement. So that is really in contrast to this Heisenberg uncertainty principle where you do a strong measurement at a given instance in time. And then we saw that in this case, uh, when we have such a system, then uh, that is kind of uh, telling us that there is on one hand imprecision, that is uh, you have a minimum motion that you can resolve compared to the noise. And we can make this imprecision smaller by increasing, for example, the laser power, but that comes at a price. At some point, there will be the back action noise that starts to play. And then uh, at the standard quantum limit, the best operating point um, um, is the best operating point to measure. 
And when I mean operating point, that means something that's proportional to the laser power. But still also here, we see that we have now a laser, um, we have the optimal mechanical system, and this is of course very specific. So also here we can generalize the argument a little bit more in the sense that there is a displacement of this mirror. And in the end, when the light has fallen onto this photo detector, we are getting a voltage out. So also here, we can kind of view this uh, measurement scheme uh, also as a... Okay. Um, so um, in this case, uh, we see that uh, we are now talking about these uh, quantum limits and we see that there's always noise added, whether it is in the house case derivation, whether it is a uh, noise added to the, uh, to the output of our measurement system or whether it's the back action noise. In all these cases, there is a noise added. So if we now go back to the picture that we had here, then uh, we said, okay, usually we're not so much interested in actual displacement. We want to know what is the force that is acting on this, uh, this thing here. But now we also understand that this is not the entire picture that we have because this displacement is very difficult to measure. And when we try that, we have kind of this uh, picture from a standard quantum limit, namely that our detector can be viewed as a amplifier that converts or transduces the displacement we're trying to measure into a voltage over here. And then uh, hopefully we get something that looks like this, nicely sinusoidal as a function of time. But we know that in practice, uh, or fundamentally speaking, there will always be noise. And when we talk about noise, that means on one hand there's imprecision noise, that we can either add at the beginning of the amplifier or at the output of the amplifier. I've uh, put it here so that uh, we have the uh, input referred amp uh, noise that we can directly compare to the displacement that we're trying to measure here. So that is one thing. Um, but the other thing is that also we have forces that are that uh, are noises. So we already saw there is the back action noise coming from the detector as well. Um, and also there will be other forces that we don't really want to have acting on our mechanical element. And they give rise to the thermal uh, motion, the Brownian motion that I showed you earlier, and also the quantum zero point motion we can kind of see as a force that is acting on the harmonic oscillator. So in this case, uh, that means that uh, this is the thing we want to measure, but in practice, it's going to look something like this. So you can see it is now noisy, but on top of that, it also has a larger amplitude because of this back action noise. So we try to measure now this, um, this nice blue line, but you can see there is noise in the output and there's also noise that is disturbing the motion we're trying to measure. And from this motion, of course, we have to infer the force acting on it. So if there's now a lot of additional motion, we're going to do a bad job in estimating the force that was acting on our mechanical device. So the bottom line of this slide is that there are many places where there's additional noise coming into uh, our measurement scheme, and all of these things are bad. So in this case, let's now turn our attention again to the standard quantum limit. So in this case, uh, we have seen this, uh, this picture. In this case, it shows you on the horizontal axis, the laser power divided by that uh, to reach the SQL, meaning in this case, this minimum here was at one. But uh, more general, we can also say this is basically the coupling between the mechanical resonator and the detector that we have. And the amount of coupling indicated with symbol C uh, determines on one hand how well we can resolve the motion, that's the light blue line that's going down, but also how much we distort the motion and what kind of motion is it? Well, the motion that we're trying to measure. And in this case, uh, you can see that's highlighted in gray. So what is now this resolvable motion and why is there still this gray box? Well, when you analyze the standard quantum limit uh, pretty uh, from a mathematical point of view, you will see that this is actually the resolvable motion expressed in units of the zero point motion. So in this case, we see that this gray line is at one, meaning this uh, line is actually representing the zero point motion. And that is why this is called the standard quantum limit. Because so far, I only showed you that there is a minimum, but not how that was related to quantum mechanics. But now we see that this minimum is, well, very close to the quantum zero point motion. And in case you're wondering, what do I now mean with resolvable motion? Well, there would be a lot of technical details, but uh, as you can see from the picture over here, it is actually related to the power spectral density at the output of your, uh, of your detector. So 
In this case, uh, we now understand better what this, uh, this plot means. And now uh, we can see what happens with this resolution. Well, it turns out that this resolution is actually given by one half times um, c to the, uh, to the power minus one half. And that's exactly the curve that we see over here. Meaning if c is equal to one, we actually have here minus one half times the zero point motion. Then we also uh, see that there is this, um, this other line, the photon force noise. And that one is also one half and the square root with c. But in this case, it's really the square root, not one over the square root. So this one is increasing with the amount of coupling between the resonator and the detector. And also here, when we go to the, uh, to the coupling where we are at the standard quantum limit, also there we have one half. Um, and then uh, we see that uh, the total measured motion, that is the uh, black line here, has a minimum where the resolution, that's the imprecision, and the back action, that is the photon uh, force noise, are the same contribution. And that is what we call the standard quantum limit. Uh, and in this case, uh, we see that at the standard quantum limit, both the uh, imprecision and the photon force noise uh, equal half the zero point motion, that is the gray line. And then uh, that means that in this case, uh, both of these unwanted parts um, of our uh, signal that ends up in our say, oscilloscope, in our spectrum analyzer, um, is going to be adding up to exactly the same as the zero point motion. So in other words, if we have this uh, standard quantum limit, then the best that we can do is get additional noise that is the same amount as the zero point motion. And now I hope that rings a bell. This is exactly the same thing as we saw in the house case derivation, where also we have that any linear um, time independent uh, amplifier uh, for boson modes is also adding half a quantum in the high gain limit. So we see that the standard quantum limit and the house case derivation are really uh, intimately connected with each other. And it means that in this case, uh, the smallest motion that we can measure is square root of two times the zero point motion. Why square root of two? Well, that's because these two contributions and the one we're trying to measure have to be added up squared. And then we get two times uh, the the total motion. So when you take the square root of that, you get the square root of two times the zero point motion. Well, as we said, um, the thing that we're trying to measure is this thing in gray. And I don't know what you think, but I think the gray is not so uh, good, uh, well visible. So let's make this uh, line now uh, in red. Uh, and then uh, we see that this is really the thing that is important over here. Well, when we talked about the standard quantum limit, we saw that in this case, uh, we have our optomechanical system. And then uh, we are now um, in a position to understand that uh, measuring this position also means looking at noise. So in other words, what we probably wanna do is connect our photodiode to the spectrum analyzer that we had before. And now depending on what kind of laser power, what kind of coupling we have between the uh, mechanics and the detector, then uh, we're going to have different spectra that would appear on the spectrum analyzer. So for example, if we are here at the position of this arrow, that is C is equal to 0 0.1, meaning the laser power is only 10% of the laser power that we need to reach the um, standard quantum limit. Then in this case, uh, we can look at, uh, at what comes out of our detector. So those are here uh, shown as the two graphs. So in this case, this is the value for C that we have here. And then here we are looking at the output power spectral density coming out of the detector. And in this case, uh, we can also ask ourselves, well, what is then the motion doing? So that is what we see here. So the right panel here is in, uh, uh, it is a simulation. So the actual numbers do not uh, matter, but this is given in volt per square root Hertz. And in this case, we also see the other one, which is then in, uh, in units of uh, meter per square root uh, Hertz. So this is now really, input referred power spectral density. And then in this case, you can also see there's a number of lines and those lines are corresponding to the different contributions that we see in this plot over here. And you can see that at 0 0.1, then in this case, um, the resolution is, uh, is over here. And that means that this light blue line is the imprecision. That's the, uh, the noise coming out of the photodiode, even if there's no motion at all. 
But of course, we know there is motion. There's the zero point motion indicated in red. Why in red? Well, that's because we told it was so important. And that one is shown like this. So here on the horizontal axis, we have the frequency. And in this case, we saw that uh, this thing over here basically corresponds to the resonance frequency. So you can see that uh, if we now take a cut like this and bring it over here, then it is actually here at the resonance frequency. Sorry, I forgot to put uh, the horizontal frequency labels here. But the zero point motion is not the only thing. Also, when we try to measure, we have the back action, and that is in dark blue. So you can see there is also a contribution from the back action, but it is pretty small in this case. So in this case, uh, this is um, what we have. Zero point motion is still uh, larger than the back action, but still the imprecision noise is a lot larger. And therefore, in the output, you are only seeing a tiny bump over here meaning you're not going to do a very good job in measuring the motion and still the motion is pretty much due to the uh, uh, the zero point motion um, and then in this case um, when thinking back about this amplifier picture for our detector then in this case we have to remember that if we now increase the power then in this case also the noise increased so in this case uh, we saw that uh, the amount of noise increased as the square root of the laser power, in other words, as the square root of the coupling. But this is really the noise that is added at the output. So we can also see this detector as something that has a gain that is proportional to the power. We saw before that in this case, the signal is proportional to the laser power that we need, in other words, proportional to C. So that would be the, the gain of this amplifier picture. And then if you would calculate now the input referred noise, that is you take the noise proportional to the um, square root of the coupling. Here's the gain, which is proportional to the coupling. You put the noise now at the input. Then in this case, you see that the input referred noise, the one that you can compare uh, with the actual displacement is actually decreasing as one over the square root of the laser power or equivalently one over the square root of the coupling. So that makes the connection now to this amplifier. So uh, what happens now if we go um, and then uh, go to a little bit higher coupling? We turn on uh, the, the knob and we increase the laser power so that now we're at the standard quantum limit. Well, that means that now you can see we are going to a new operating point, And that also means that in this case, the uh, power spectral densities will be different. So this is still the one for 0 0.1. Now we're at one, and then they look something like this. So you can see that in this case, if I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then you can see that in this case, by going to a higher coupling, this uh, blue line, the light blue line has dropped, and that means we can now resolve smaller motion. Also, we see that this red line here didn't change. That's of course because it is horizontal here. So let me again go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you can see the differences. So what we also see is that this dark blue line, the back action, has also increased. And it has now increased to the same amount as the light blue line. That's why they touch here. But still, the unwanted motion, the back action induced motion, is still smaller than um, the zero point motion that we're trying to measure. But at least it becomes comparable. And now when we look at the output over here, then in this case, you see that the output is now larger. And that's, of course, because we have increased the laser power, uh, increasing both the signal as well as the total noise. That's the line that we have over here. Um, and now you can also see that the peak in the, uh, in the power spectral density that is due to the mechanical motion is now a lot better visible than in this case. So here it was a tiny peak. Now at least we have a larger peak. In this case, still, most of the motion is due to the uh, zero point motion as we're trying to measure. So now we can go further, increase the laser power even further, turn up the knob on your laser. Now we go to, P, uh, to C is equal to 10. And in this case, this will be the picture. So now you can see the resolution or the imprecision, if you wish, has uh, been decreased even further. The zero point motion as before, still the same, but now this dark blue line over here is a lot higher in, uh, in magnitude. And that means that now most of the motion is actually the motion that we induce by bombarding our mechanical resonator with all these uh, photons. So in this case, it is not the measure um, motion we're trying to measure, but it is actually 
more than that. So now we have a lot of unwanted ones. And then if we look at the output at the detector, then in this case, we see that uh, this is now amplified more, there's more noise, but still is overwhelmed by the stuff that doesn't even fit here on the chart anymore. So you can see that in this case, by increasing the coupling too much, we are mainly driving now the mechanical resonator with the photon shot noise and not with the signals that we're trying to measure. In this example, the zero point motion, but of course, uh, it will also be uh, related later on to the passing of gravitational waves. So this is the standard quantum limit if you do everything perfectly, but in an experiment, typically things are not perfect. So the last thing that I want to address here is talk about losses. So um, there can be two ways in which life gets lost. For example, it could be that the light is lost before it actually reaches the cavity. For example, there is a lens here that is not entirely coded uh, perfectly as we wanted it to be. In this case, you can see the amount of light reaching the cavity is reduced. But this by itself is not so much a problem because usually we can crank up the laser power and then uh, we actually have that we get the same situation as before. So in this case, no problem, crank up the laser power. Of course, your laser should be able to do it, but if, uh, if that is the case, then that is no problem at all. The situation is more severe if the light is lost after the cavity. For example, if there's another lens uh, that is not uh, nicely coded over here, because that means that the mirror, uh, the mechanical part is still feeling the back action noise of the original one, but the information that is being carried is actually lost. So in this case, uh, we see the back action stays the same, but the information is partially lost. And then when we would now look at these V-shaped curves that we had before for the standard quantum limit, then in this case, uh, you can see here we have the laser power. In dark blue, we have the original curve that we had before with a nice minimum at the standard quantum limit. And that corresponded to a square root of two times this gray line. And now we see that uh, if we have this, uh, this thing, but we have more losses, then you see that there is a shift um, towards the, uh, the right and up uh, when we have more losses. In other words, when we lose the light here after the cavity, and it basically uh, means you have to increase the laser power. But in this case, you can see these minima indicated by the dots are still going up. So you can kind of correct uh, for some of these losses by increasing the laser power, but there's no way to avoid the extra back action noise in this case. Uh, you are going to get a little bit more of the information back. So in this case, we see these dots, they are going up with increasing losses. So we have a larger resolvable motion. In other words, losses are bad. And I think that's something that is always the case when you try to do something with quantum mechanics. If you lose information, it's all bad. Okay, so that basically means we have now covered everything there is to cover in part uh, number two when we talked about the quantum limits. So that means now we are reaching uh, the final and I would say uh, piece de uh, la resistance, namely we're going to talk about the detection of gravitational waves. So in this case, uh, the very first question that we should ask ourselves is what are gravitational waves? And I must confess that here I'm not an expert. So I, am, I have a background, as you saw, in uh, nano and optomechanics. Um, I know my physics, but I'm not an expert in gravitational waves. But I do know that these things are important because um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize, and that means you should definitely know something about it. And of course, uh, I have been reading up and, uh, about this. Uh, but in this case, uh, don't ask me any question about general relativ relativity and how exactly these things propagate. I am more the uh, person to ask how you can detect them. Well, it turns out that uh, detecting these gravitational waves is really engineering and also doing optomechanics for the most demanding application. So in this case, uh, we're really gonna see how you can use the techniques of optomechanics that are described in the first two parts to detect gravitational waves. So what are gravitational waves? So gravitational waves are created by massive objects um, that, uh, that uh, create curvature in space-time. And that basically means that when these massive objects are moving through space, they will uh, take part of this curvature along with it. And now general relativity predicts that when these massive objects have a changing acceleration, 
then there will be uh, outward propagating disturbances of space time. In other words, we have gravitational waves that are being emitted. So now the question is, of course, well, great that space time is actually uh, uh, has some disturbances that are propagating. But what are these gravitational waves? In other words, what is now exactly disturbed or waving? Well, it means that if a gravitational wave passes by, then the distance between objects, that is test masses that we can put in our lab, will oscillate if, when the gravitational wave passes by. And we can measure that using the so-called strain. So this is not a physical strain, but it's basically the change in the distance between these objects divided by the distance that they originally had. In this case, uh, when we measure the strain, we will be able to detect uh, the gravitational wave. So now let's consider a ring of test particles and then uh, we're going to put in our lab and then hopefully a gravitational wave is passing by and we assume that it's propagating perpendicular to the screen. So if that is the case, then uh, in the lab, the particles would be moving like this. So we see that now the different uh, directions uh, contract and expand periodically uh, and they uh, expand and contract periodic periodically uh, perpendicular to the screen. That, that is actually the polarization of the wave. So, well, that's rather easy, right? So all we now have to do is take a tape measure, put one here, put one there, and read off the position of all our test masses the whole time. And then, well, it's easy. We see the gravitational wave pass by. Well, if it was that easy, then of course we didn't have to wait uh, until uh, a few years back to detect them. And the biggest challenge here is that uh, the strain uh, delta L over L is only of the order of 10 to the minus 20. So the, uh, the distance oscillations are going to be extremely small. And that means you have to be very sensitive in detecting the position of these, uh, these, divide, uh, these test part particles. So the measurements are definitely challenging. And another complication is that, well, even if you would have very good eyes and a very good ruler, then you simply cannot do the measurement that way because also the ruler is consisting of particles. There are atoms in there. So also the ruler will be um, expanding and contracting uh, periodically. So instead you have to use light to measure the distance between these particles. In other words, you have to use light to detect motion, to detect displacements. That is in other words, optimal mechanics. And as I said, these uh, strains that uh, are expected are extremely small. Just to put this into perspective, assume that we now place test masses over a distance of one meter, then with this strain of 10 to the minus 20, you find that the change in, uh, in distance will be about 0 0.01 eto meter. So that sounds really, really small, and indeed it is. If you now would place these uh, test masses much further apart, say four kilometers, then in this case, this uh, change in length is of the order of 0 0.0 for femtometers. So of course, this still sounds like an extremely small number, but at least we now know that optomechanics has a sensitivity of the order of femtometer per square root hertz. So with optomechanics, it uh, should definitely be uh, possible to observe uh, events if they uh, take about a second or longer uh, to occur. So with very long uh, distances between the test masses and very sensitive optomechanical devices, we have uh, a chance to observe these uh, gravitational waves. Well, a further complication is that if you try to build a fiber perot cavity uh, with uh, such uh, long arms, then in this case, the distance between the mirrors is four kilometers, and that means that the different resonances will be spaced by only something like 38 kilohertz, whereas the light oscillates at a frequency of a few hundreds terahertz. So it will become very difficult to lock um, a laser to such a cavity if it is that long. But I can tell you that despite all these challenges, it is possible. And now we're going to take a closer look at what is required to actually measure this uh, uh, gravitational waves. So um, the gravitational waves were detected uh, by LIGO, which is, uh, the gravitational wave observatory and actually there are two of these uh, one is located in louisiana the other one is located in washington and you can see here a map of the united states and these are the two locations um, and in each of these uh, observatories um, the uh, 
the difference in length is measured in two arms of the interferometer. So you can see this uh, kind of boomerang shape, and those are two different uh, perpendicular arms. Uh, each of them have their own interferometer, and they can measure the difference in length. And that's, of course, exactly what you need, uh, because some of the particles are contracting and other ones are being uh, moving further away. So in this case, you can, uh, can see that you need two arms to measure this. Uh, when you uh, would look at the signal coming from such an uh, uh, observatory or from such a detector, you will see that there's going to be many local effects. But uh, when you now see coincidences, you see strong correlations between the signal in both places, then you know it is a global effect. Well, or at least a continental effect, I would say, but then we can also be pretty sure that it's also a global effect. In other words, something that uh, is caused by the gravitational waves. And here we see uh, the time trace from the two detect uh, detectors from the two observatories in Washington and Hanford uh, on the left, and in uh, Livingston, Louisiana on the right side. This was taken on, uh, in 2015 at day 14 of some month. I think that is kind of cropped off, uh, but one instance in time. And in this case, we see the signal coming from Washington. And here we see in blue the signal coming from Louisiana. And you can see that in this case, it is really nicely uh, coincidating. So in this case, you can see there is a signal. It looks a bit noisy. OK, there are some oscillations here. And maybe you think, oh, what's that? Could be a farmer uh, passing by with his tractor or something like that. But you see exactly the same thing a few thousand uh, kilometers uh, further away. So in this case, you uh, see the nice coincidence between these uh, these things. So, um, so that is uh, that is one thing uh, that uh, that we immediately see. And then, of course, the other question is: Well, is this something that uh, we expect? And uh, people have uh, simulated events that they could expect, and then they would expect a signal like over here. So, in this case, you can see very nicely that there are these oscillations. They grow and grow, but at the same time, get faster and faster. And you can uh, also plot that in terms of these. Um, these nice frequency as a function of time plots over here. Um, and also what you can do and do is take the difference between the observed uh, waveform, the one that is measured, and the one that's calculated and look at the residuals. And then in that case, you should only see noise. And well, this looks pretty noisy to me. So that's of course great. And this was actually the very first time that the gravitational wave was observed in those, in that uh, LIGO gravitational wave detector. Um, so um, as I said, uh, once you measure something in both places, you know it's a global effect. You also have to, uh, to see if this is the right uh, wavelet. Uh, in this case, it was for a black hole pair merger. That is, there are two black holes that are very close by. And then uh, initially, they are circling around each other. And in this case, uh, they are circling around, lose their energy. They get closer and closer together. And at some point, they actually merge. And then um, they become one big. Uh, black hole, but of course, uh, there's still some information uh, about the original black holes, and you can see it has this like potato shape, and that uh, one will be oscillating and uh, going back and forth, and then at some point, very quickly afterwards, it has a nice circular uh, black hole uh, shape, which is again a nice uh, sphere over here, just like the original ones that we had, and this, uh, this ring down has uh, has passed out. And those are really the, uh, the different things that you see. And after it has rung down, after it has become uh, stationary, you see then the signal also disappears. And you can then, once you have this, uh, these kind of simulations, also see how, uh, how the separation evolves as a function of time and how uh, the relative velocity is and so on. Uh, and in this case, um, they found that they could also, using this model, tell what the, um, uh, what the masses was of those uh, those black holes and already saw that in this case that was heavier than they would have expected on average to happen okay so that was the first detection event so uh, in this case let's now take a closer look at what is required to actually reach this uh, detection event so as i said the detector is called ligo it consists of two observatories and the word ligo is actually an acronym it stands for laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory and there are two identical uh, gravitational wave detectors, um, one in Louisiana, one in uh, Washington state. Uh, and um, 
They are operated by Caltech and MIT, and they're funded by the National Science Foundation. And uh, initially, uh, the, uh, the detectors were built according to one plan, that was the initial design. Then uh, after a few years, they improved the design, so they changed certain parts, improved it. It was enhanced LIGO, and now we're at the stage where uh, there's more improvements, and that is called advanced LIGO. So what does this uh, gravitational wave uh, laser interferometer look like? Well, it is actually a modified Michelson interferometer. And uh, perhaps you know that a Michelson interferometer looks something like this. You have a laser that falls onto a um, half reflecting mirror, half the light goes straight through, half of it is reflected. And then there are two really uh, reflecting mirrors that reflect the light back and also here. And then the reflected light uh, combines here, interferes at this mirror, at this beam splitter, and then part of it goes to the detector and part of it goes straight through. So laser light is split by a 50-50 beam splitter in the center. There's reflection in each of the arm back onto the beam splitter. There will be interference between the light coming from those two parts. And then uh, on the detector, you will detect a certain amount of power that depends on the phase difference between the two arms. In this case, this phase difference is the difference between the phase in the y direction and in this x direction. And then the amount of power that you detect is the total power that you send into the interferometer times the cosine squared of this phase difference that you have. And uh, in case you're wondering, well, you send in power P0, you're only detecting uh, P0 times cosine squared, whereas the rest going well, the rest of the power goes back towards the laser and is not being used. So in this case, you see we have this cosine squared. And in this case, uh, you have sinusoidal fringes. And although we didn't talk too much about that uh, in this uh, short introduction, um, if you would use now a high finesse far cavity, you would actually have lots steeper fringes uh, than uh, in this case uh, using a, a Michelson interferometer. So um, in this case, why did they use it? And uh, well, it turns out that this is actually a modified Michelson interferometer. So when we look in more detail what it looks like, it's not like the picture we have over here, but more like the picture we see over here. Where in this case, there is a laser, there is a beam splitter, there are these two, uh, two mirrors with the two parts, and there is a photo detector, but you can see actually uh, there is another mirror over here. So in this case, it's the power recycling mirror, meaning if the light uh, that is, um, interfering at the beam split is now going to walk back towards the laser, it actually encounters this, uh, uh, this mirror and actually most of it is gonna be reflected back into the interferometer. And you can see from the, uh, from the colors over here or from the thickness of the line that initially you start with little laser power. Well, I can tell you 20 watts of laser power is actually a really, really big lot. Um, but in this case, that is then enhanced by this power recycling. Um, and that's not the only thing. You also see that there are not the two end mirrors for the two parts, but there are also these other mirrors over here. And these are basically forming, in this case, four kilometer long fiber perot cavities here and here. And you can see that now in those cavities, there's about 100 kilowatts of laser power circulating. So a huge amount of light are being used to measure the position of these, uh, of these test masses, these mirrors. And then this is what, uh, what a picture uh, looks like. If you take an aerial view, you can see the buildings containing uh, the lasers, containing those mirrors here and the beam splitter. And then you see those pipes running into the distance. There's another one here that is uh, not so well shown. And then when you take a more ground-based view, you can see uh, what this, uh, this thing looks like. And you also have uh, some cars and tractors as a scale bar to see what, what it looks like. So if we now take a closer look at, uh, at this, then we can see again the same picture. We see that there is now a fire baroque cavity in each of the arms and the finesse is about 220. So the finesse tells us how many times the light bounces back and forth in this fire baroque cavity. And we also had this recycling mirror and both of these things, the high finesse and these uh, power recycling um, basically means that now we have 100 kilowatts of laser power to measure. So you can imagine, Again, this V-shaped curve. So we now go really to very, uh, very high uh, values on the right side. 
Uh, but of course, now the situation is a little bit more complex. Before we said, oh, it is just this, uh, this phase difference. Now it also means that uh, we have to take the motion of all four of these mirrors into account. And it turns out that this interferometer is actually sensitive um, to the differential motion. That is the difference between those two mirrors here minus the difference between those uh, two mirrors that we have in the x direction. And in this case, um, that is exactly uh, the kind of motion that you will uh, see when you have a gravitational wave passing by. Well, a further complication or improvement is that actually you need to operate this entire huge interferometer in ultra high vacuum. I can tell you in our lab, we are struggling sometimes to reach a pressure of 10 to the minus six millibars. In this case, they have this huge kilometer long uh, gravitational wave detector in ultra high vacuum at a pressure of four, 10 to the minus nine millibars. So very, very low pressures. So why do they do that? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, they want to uh, prevent uh, air molecules from bombarding the movable mirrors because that, of course, would also mean additional forces that you don't want. You, uh, they want to measure the force from the gravitational waves and not the force coming from the air molecules bombarding the movable mirrors. But another thing is they are using the, uh, the Fabro cavity to measure the displacements. And if there's a small fluctuation in the density of the air in here or in here, then it will change the, um, um, the um, refractive index and therefore also the resonance condition of the light in these cavities and act as if the mirror was moving, where, whereas it actually was just a fluctuation of the density in air. So it seems that uh, by uh, pumping this thing down to very low pressures, they can uh, at least get rid of those contributions. So what about these mirrors? Well, these mirrors are uh, suspended mirrors. They weigh about 11 kilograms and they uh, move rather slowly, about once per second. And this is a picture of what one of those mirrors look like. And again, the scale bar is standing now to the uh, left of this, uh, this thing. So you can see the uh, shiny purple thing. That is one of those, uh, those mirrors. And you can see the coating, which is, uh, which is of course meant to work very well at the uh, frequency or the wavelength of the laser, 1064 nanometers, meaning in the visible range, it is not looking like a nice shiny mirror, but has this, in this case, purplish color under this angle. So that's the mechanical part. That is some of the requirements. But of course, when we now look at the output of the photo detector, then uh, what are we going to get? Well, then we have to talk about the sensitivity because also when there's no gravitational wave, there is going to be output of the detector and that's the output we don't want. So we have to talk about what's coming out first before we can look at the gravitational waves. So in this case, uh, these are the typical plots that we have uh, in, uh, for these kind of uh, sensitivities. So in this case, uh, let me guide you through it. It looks rather intimidating with all those colors, but here you can see the strain. And in this case, the strain is expressed in one over square root of Hertz. So in other words, we are now looking at the power spectral density of these, uh, these relative length changes that, uh, that they have. And then on the horizontal axis, you see the frequency. So in this case, there will be at different frequencies, different contributions to the spectrum. And those are indicated by the different colors of the curve. And then the gray curve, the dark gray curve is actually the combined total noise that you have. So when we now take a closer look at all those different curves and which one is contributed most to the total noise, then you see that in this range, say above uh, this point over here, then in this case, we see that it's mainly um, this purple contribution that is the quantum noise. So in this case, I think now from this lecture, I hope you learned that um, this is really the short noise of the light impinging on the photo detector. So for most of the spectrum, the advanced LIGO is uh, limited by the short noise of the measurement. In other words, it's really a quantum limited detector. There's not much more you can do. At least that's what we would think now. The other contribution that is uh, still important, say in this range over here, is the red one. So in this case, that corresponds to the uh, Brownian uh, motion of the coding. And now when we compare that to previous uh, cases, so in this case, this for advanced LIGO, in this case, when we look at this noise budget for say um, the uh, initial LIGO, 
And in this case, you can see that uh, now still there is the quantum noise level over here, but here the initial LIGO is actually uh, going up already a lot earlier than what uh, they have here. So in this case, still for most of the, uh, the graph, it is limited by uh, quantum noise. So they definitely did a good job in going from the initial design to the advanced design. What you also see is that at low frequencies, there's other contributions. For example, there's this brown one, and that is actually uh, coming from seismic noise. So in this case, these are vibrations in the, um, in the ground where uh, the uh, LIGO detector is located. And we already saw a few slides ago that there were uh, cars, that there were trucks uh, standing by, and those are actually things that are driving around and they cause vibrations. And of course, we talked about that these mirrors should not move more than 0.04 femtometer um, to, uh, uh, to actually detect these gravitational waves. So you can imagine if a car passes by or if a farmer wants to harvest, then they are generating a lot larger vibrations. So somehow these vibrations should be damped out. And we see that in this case, a lot of noise is coming from the environment. Uh, we talked about cars, there's also seismic activity, there's even waves crashing uh, hundreds of uh, kilometers away uh, onto the shore. That's something you can all pick up with those extremely sensitive uh, gravitational wave detectors, unless you're very careful. And when I say careful, that means that the suspension of these mirrors is actually something that's critical. So it is not just taking one of those big mirrors and putting it on a little uh, little wire. No, you can see that there are all these different uh, things happening here with a lot of engineering and a lot, lot of um, stuff going on. And actually, when I was watching uh, some of the talks by the people who built LIGO, um, they actually had a lot of problems in, uh, in this suspension. So they uh, wanted to use uh, uh, silica uh, fibers to hang these, uh, these mirrors, but it turned out that every once in a while, these things would just fall down. And you can imagine if you have such a beautiful uh, mirror that weighs about 40 kilogram in this, uh, this case, uh, with all the very high uh, quality optics and coatings and so on, and the thing just falls down and breaks into pieces, you must be very, uh, very sad. But uh, at some point they figured out what the problem was and they were able to suspend these, uh, these things with these, uh, these silica fibers that give very low noise. But still that's not enough. There's also that this thing is moving. There's another mirror uh, hanging over here that has no real function other than having exactly the same mass and the same properties so that one is swinging, the other one is kind of anti-swimming, uh, swinging and hanging still in this, uh, in this case. And also you can see there are here um, vertical isolation stages of, um, of steel springs and so on. So there's a lot of engineering going on. And it turns out that in this case, when you look how many uh, isolation stages, how many of those uh, pendulums and, uh, and uh, spring stages you need, then you can see that uh, the motion of the test masses is really the thing that has to be isolated the most critically. So here they need three different vertical isolation stages and four of those pendulum uh, stages to prevent the horizontal swinging. And then the final uh, spring, if you wish, or the final thing to hang it up is in this case, a few silica fibers that I told you uh, about before that would sometimes break. And that's because in this case, they really had to have very low vibrations um, in this case, uh, remaining for the mirrors. Also the beam splitter is something that you have to stabilize very well. In this case, you can see it is about a 60 times less sensitive. And that means that they can use uh, less stages and also can use steel wires instead of those silica wires that tend to break. Then for all the other things that we have here, still you need to, uh, to do a good job, uh, but in, uh, in essence, the uh, requirements become less and less stringent in this, uh, this case. So it is really the test masses and also this beam split that are extremely sensitive to vibrations. So they did a lot of engineering, but uh, what if that uh, is not enough? So as we saw, the strain sensitivity after all that engineering is for most of the frequencies limited by the shot noise in the readout. And we saw that is directly related to the standard quantum limit. So there's no way to beat the standard quantum limit of a detector, right? It turns out there is, and this was of course related to one of the questions that were asked earlier on. So in this case, there was a nice paper uh, showing that they could enhance the sensitivity that is resolve even smaller motion by using squeezed states of light. So in this case, uh, we can look at what uh, uh, their setup looks like in this case. There is now um, the laser, the power recycling mirror. So basically all the stuff over here 
that is uh, now showing you the um, um, uh, the uh, LIGO interferometer that we have seen before. And uh, now the new thing is this thing over here. So uh, what is this thing that is going just towards the photodiode? Um, well, in this case, um, the stuff comes in here like that. Uh, and in this case, you can see it is kind of injected uh, in the inverse direction. So the light goes into the interferometer, bounces back and forth, comes out on this side, and then goes to the detect to the photodiode. In this case, they also have this, uh, in, uh, this thing over here in the gray box where the light is sent in here and sent the wrong way. So what do they do? Well, in this case, um, usually you would not have any of this stuff here in the, uh, in the gray box. And what would go back into the interferometer is just vacuum. In other words, a vacuum state, nothing at all. And you could think, well, how could you do better than having nothing at all injected? Well, it turns out that you can have better than nothing. So in this case, if you would look at nothing, at vacuum, and ask what is the noise in vacuum, then you actually have noise as well. So this is related to the quantum ground state of, um, uh, of the bosonic modes. Um, and that means if you put a detector there, you're still going to measure fluctuations. But what you can do is you can actually squeeze the vacuum. So in this case, you can see there are two directions, the in-phase and the quadrature direction, in which you have equal amounts of noise if you have vacuum. But if you use this, uh, this uh, thing that contains an uh, optical parametric amplifier, uh, uh, oscillator to basically um, change here the vacuum state into something that is squeezed, just like you would squeeze an orange. Then in this case, the amount of noise in this direction is now reduced. Of course, it is increased in this direction, but it only means you should probably measure in this direction and not along that direction. And when you do that, you actually get less noise than you would when you would simply send vacuum in. Does that work? Well, here you can see the comparison. So in this case, the red one was the uh, original advanced LIGO. And then by injecting the squeezed light, they were able to get below this dashed line, this, uh, the short noise limit by a little bit. And this little bit, was that just a little bit that they needed to detect the gravitational wave or not? I guess we'll never know, but it definitely shows you that you should really play every trick in the book that you can find to, um, uh, to build these gravitational wave detectors. And it means that uh, these gravitational wave detectors are usually backed by lots of people. So here you can see the author list from the advanced LIGO experiment. You can see many, many different people contributed, some of them in theory, some of them in actually designing the experiments, some of them in terms of the noise cancellation and so on. But a lot of people um, were involved in these kind of uh, extremely sensitive, I would say state-of-the-art optomechanical devices and with this nice picture about gravitational waves merging together with the signal, I think we have reached the end of today's lecture. So with that, I thank you for your attention, for listening. And I want to uh, give you now the opportunity to ask any questions on the topic that we address now or that we have addressed earlier on in this lecture. So if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask. Feel free to ask. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So in a coupled quantum system, when you are detecting uh, an optomechanical uh, cavities uh, mm -hmm. signals uh, from the photodiode or uh, from any electrical readout, uh, how do you deconvolute uh, the noise contributions? Um, so I think you are referring to the, um, uh, to for example, these kind of pictures. Am I exactly. correct? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So that is a little bit the problem, uh, that is you cannot. So in this case, the only thing that you will measure is this, uh, this black line. And in this case, you cannot say uh, if you have a, uh, if you measure say one volt uh, with your uh, measurement equipment at a certain instance in time, what part of that volt was due to the, the noise fluctuations, what part was due to the motion you're trying to measure and what part uh, was due to uh, unwanted motion. So unfortunately you cannot, and you cannot distinguish between all the different contributions to this black line. Um, so now um, there is, of course, the thing that usually what we uh, what we do uh, when we talk about, uh, say, force sensing is not look at the spectra that I've uh, shown you here, but as you can see from the say the beautiful gravitational wave detection, this is something that actually happens in the time domain. 
And in this case, uh, when you have these kind of time traces, then what you can try to do is actually use what is called estimators or estimation theory uh, with the knowledge of your system, with the knowledge of the noise, and then try to reconstruct actually the real force that was acting on this thing. But I can also tell you that in this case, uh, this is really the raw output coming from the, uh, from the gravitational wave detectors without any filtering. So they also have lots of things um, installed in data processing, but here they were really showing the, the raw data without any, uh, any filtering. And uh, what is also interesting in this case is that um, um, they also have um, a way that um, to test these kind of things and to unbias uh, these measurements. So it turns out that uh, they were actually seeing a lot of these events before, but they were kind of randomly uh, inserted into the data that they were measuring. So in this case, they would uh, sometimes see these kind of events and then would say, oh, we have a gravitational wave. And then um, they would do all the data processing work out. And then uh, at some point, someone would say, yes, very nice how you did it, but this was some, uh, some synthetic event that we inserted in the data. And then they could check a kind of unbiased without knowing if this was an actual event or a synthetic one, how the data processing and so on would work. And then um, I think very soon after that, they actually matched the real event. And then they processed it without knowing if it was a real one or a fake one and found uh, all the results. And then, well, it turned out to be a real one. No one has inserted this in here. So that's also something that goes in there. And that's a little bit related to this estimation question. Okay, so any other questions from the audience? So this is really your chance to ask any questions you have, right? Because uh, soon the lecture will be over. So make sure to use this opportunity. So I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Please uh, can, can you uh, give more examples of ways to beat the standard quantum limits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's of course, uh, I would say a little bit disappointing, right? So I spent all this time um, to, uh, to explain about the standard quantum limit. And then in the end I said, oh yeah, but you can actually circumvent it. So, um, I mean, I think there is a very good reason to call it the standard quantum limit or the, the quantum limit in general. And that's because it's actually very, very hard to beat it. So uh, one way is to use this, uh, these squeezed uh, states. That is uh, uh, in this case, the blue, uh, the blue line that is here. And uh, that was done using this uh, this entire setup, uh, which actually, if you look at the photographs, is a complete optical table filled with all the different components that you need. Uh, it is not just, oh, send this, uh, this laser onto a, um, onto a nonlinear crystal and you get it out. No, it turns out that you need to do a lot of stabilization. They need to have phase control uh, to actually send it in the right way. Because if you don't, then uh, if the ellipse would be like this, uh, you would do actually a worse job. In, uh, in, uh, in, in the noise and you would actually increase the noise. Um, so that is one thing. And of course, the state that you have, the squeeze state is actually very, very fragile. So if you lose any light again on the, uh, on the way towards the interferometer before you can actually insert it, that basically means you are going from this nice uh, squeezed state into again, something that resembles much, much more the vacuum state. And in this case, you would get back to the, uh, to the red uh, plot that I showed you earlier on. So um, doing this experiment is actually taking, I would say, years from groups that are really um, well versed in designing these kind of squeezing experiments um, to uh, to design all the different components to stabilize them and to build it exactly the way it should. And then they have like this this tiny uh, improvement in the noise. But of course, for an experiment like LIGO, it costs millions of, of dollars then in this case, it makes sense to do it, but it's not something that you can do standard uh, in, uh, in the lab. Um, so as I said, squeezing is one, uh, one case. You can also create so-called noon states. And in this case, um, you have um, a state that is not uh, generated using a laser, then you would get a coherent state. 
where in that case you would have uh, say a Poissonian distribution for the number of photons inside your uh, your light state. But in that case, you would have what is called the noon state, and that means that in this case uh, you uh, you have uh, either a fixed number of uh, of photons that is n photons that is what one of those n stands for, or you have zero in uh, in another spatial mode, or you have the other way around. So you have zero in the first one and then n in the other one, and with that kind of um, um, states you can do better than uh, than the standard quantum limit as well. So in that case, uh, you would find that the uh, uh, that the uh, the noise is actually reduced not by the square root of n, as we saw before for the Poissonian, but actually as one over n. So in this case, the noise goes down a lot faster than uh, than you would expect from regular laser uh, light. Now, of course, uh, the question is how do you generate these noon states, and that is actually something that is very very difficult to do as well. And I guess in this case, uh, people have done the two zero zero two states, uh, meaning n is equal to uh, to two with a lot of effort. Uh, and I can tell you then, of course, the uh, uh, if you have one over square root of two, or if you have one over two, the difference is not so big with all that effort. And uh, I think uh, getting even higher ones is uh, is going to be really really difficult. So yes, there are different ways that you can circumvent the standard quantum limit, but I would say in general, they're very, very difficult uh, to do in practice. Okay, so uh, I see there's also um, questions in the chat. Um, okay, so how do the mirrors prevent environmental noise? Um, okay, so that was uh, the picture that we had. Uh, where is it? Exactly. So this uh, this picture over here. So um, in this case, you should imagine uh, that uh, the setup or these mirrors are hanging kind of from the from the ceiling. They're attached in this uh, this place over here. Uh, and in this case, uh, when they are attached like that, then the ceiling is vibrating a lot because I don't know. Maybe there's a farmer or there's a wave crashing into the uh, into the shore. Uh, and then uh, the question is. If you have vibrations that are happening over here, whether they are in plane like this, like that, or out of plane that is like that, then in this case, um, how does that uh, translate into motion of the mirrors down here, the one that you really want to have hang as uh, stable as possible? So now you can imagine if you have, say, something that moves like this, you have a mass that is hanging like this, that one will be starting to swing. And then if you have exactly the same mass hanging here, then this one will swing, but the motion of this one will actually swing less. And that is the reason that they have these additional mirrors that are kind of identical to the one that have hanging down here, so that the motion of the ceiling is uh, translating to motion of this one, but it kind of cancels the motion of, uh, of this one. So this is something uh, you could also try for yourself by seeing if you have a mass on the spring here, the second mass, and you put a force onto that, uh, that first mass, what is going to happen with this one? And you'll find that for certain configurations, the motion of this one will be very small, whereas for this one, it would be, uh, uh, would still be large. Um, okay. Um, Okay, another question I see here in the chat is uh, noise independent of input. You derived it while calculating the gain G. What if there's an intrinsic noise of, of the input? Can it be in, uh, omitted or is there a case like that? That is the from the second part of the lecture. Um, indeed, so uh, we talked about the house case derivation where uh, in this case, uh, let me just pull up that slide, where we had these two, um, two final uh, ingredients. That is, we looked at how much noise is coming at the output, uh, and that then contains the uh, noise at the input, uh, and that is uh, amplified by the gain. And then here we had this additional noise by the amplifier. So maybe um, I was not entirely uh, clear about that. So in this case, there may of course be a noise in the input, and actually also the signal that we're trying to measure can be kind of seen as fluctuations into this uh, bosonic mode at the input, because in the end, what we want to have 
is that the information containing uh, the mechanical motion that we have just measured with our, say, optomechanical far row cavity is already encoded into fluctuations of this input. So that is something that is actually in here. So this is the thing that we really uh, care about, and we want to amplify these things as much as possible. But by doing that, we actually also uh, get this term over here. That's the term that we don't want. That is the term that is actually added by going from the small uh, signals in the quantum world to these large signals in our microscopic world that we need to hook up to our spectrum analyzer or something like that. Okay, um, and then another uh, question is about uh, the lecture notes. Um, so um, there is a little bit of a problem with that. Of course, I would be more than happy to share them with you, but unfortunately um, there are sometimes pictures uh, that have copyright and that means that I can only show them uh, in uh, in kind of a, um, uh, a setting where people are registered for a course and uh, and then I can uh, show it without any problems or if you are here with uh, say the summer school then I think it's also no problem to show it but I cannot make these uh, these things accessible for all uh, for everyone unfortunately so of course I would love to share the information and also these uh, these lecture notes but uh, unfortunately I cannot uh, cannot do that. Okay, any other questions from uh, from the audience? It seems that there are no more questions. Mm -hmm. So, Mena, thank you very, very much for this excellent and comprehensive series of lectures. Mm -hmm. That was a pleasure. Yeah, it was also my pleasure to, uh, to present uh, this kind of work to show a little bit of the, the nice things going on optomechanics, mechanics and then also in the context of these gravitational wave uh, wave detectors and so on. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it was really a pleasure and uh, I would say uh, to all the students, I hope you also enjoyed it. And uh, I think there are still one or two more lectures uh, to come. So please also uh, uh, yeah, enjoy those lectures. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. See you in person. Yes, let's hope that uh, that's going to take place uh, soon then. Wow. <laughs> wow.